Hello, this is uh, Pastor Patrick Hines, and this is the Brittle Heights Presbyterian Church Pulpit Supplemental. And today I wanted to go over um, a sermon that was preached by the late Dr. R.C. Sproul on justification by faith alone. I want to play it and uh, just make some comments along the way. Um, the church has been deprived of, of a great leader. Um, when he died, uh, that was a sad day uh, because he's one of the very few who understood the gospel correctly, understood what justification by faith alone was all about. Um, I also would eventually like to go through the John Ankerberg programs where, um, where Sproul was on there with D. James Kennedy and, and John MacArthur over the Evangelicals and Catholics Together document. One of the things that's been really troubling to me, one of the things that has really shocked me, um, and I need to quit saying that I'm shocked because the Apostle Paul said that. I'm shocked. I marvel. He uses the term thalmazo. I'm, I marvel that you're so quickly turning away from him who, who called you from the grace of Christ to a different gospel in, in Galatians 1.6. So it shouldn't shock us that we have to deal with this kind of stuff, I guess. Um, but one thing I've noticed uh, in the PCA, um, even when we submitted our, our revoice report, I was just taken aback once again at the indifference to Roman Catholicism. And the, the Revoice Conference had Roman Catholic speakers. And the, the answer to that was, well, they're an ecumenical group. <laughs> and I'm, I'm kind of like thinking, we're not ecumenical because we love the gospel and we want people to go to heaven. And we, we love the truth and we want to evangelize uh, people in the Roman Catholic religion. And yet there was, you know, there was Eve Tushnet and Ron Belgau um, and uh, Brother Trout, um, who was who's a, a monk, spoke at the Revoice Conference. And you think, what has happened to discernment? Um, you can't have Roman Catholic speakers at your conferences. And then when you're called out on it, just say, well, Revoice is an ecumenical group. Yeah, that's one of the major problems with Revoice, is that it doesn't care about the true gospel. It doesn't care about, evidently, um, the salvation of people's souls it can't if you're if you're going to promote individuals who are part of a communion that preaches and teaches as dogmatic truth that you must believe upon pain of the anathema of god the papacy the priesthood purgatory indulgences the marian dogmas papal infallibility and i've always encouraged people go out on the internet and read the document indulgentiarum doctrina the Apostolic Constitution on the Revision of Indulgences. That is a post-Vatican II document, written in, I think it was 1969. And what it says is shocking about the gospel, about the fact that they still believe in indulgences. That indulgences did not die out um, with the Council of Trent and with Johann Tetzel. When a, when a coin in the coffer rings a soul from Purgatory Springs and any, any of that kind of stuff, that's still there. It's still there. So... <clears throat> Shocking to say the least, um, the the indifference of, of on the part of I guess most people in the PCA uh, don't don't seem to care about the Roman Catholic issue anymore, and yet the Reformation issues are identical today as they were when uh, Luther nailed the theses to the Wittenberg door in 1517, and and they've never changed. Those issues are still on the table as being not just differences not not even just differences that are critical but somebody is under the anathema of god here someone is preaching a different gospel and you know what i admire the theologians of rome in the 16th century because they understood what today people don't understand what pastors today don't understand somebody is preaching a different gospel somebody is under the anathema of god it's either us or them Somebody has apostatized from the truth. But today, with its postmodern, Kantian indifference to truth, and its wishy-washy, um, having no place for rigorous biblical analysis and intellectual argument and exegesis of the word of God, and preferring instead shallow arguments that are cemented together with emotional stories and emotional anecdotes, most of what I have to say, I, I, there are times I feel like I was born like 300 years too late. I feel, I will tell you, I feel almost completely alone in, in my convictions. <laughs> and I've wondered again and again, like, 
what is happening? What is happening to the church today? You have people, high profile people, signing the Manhattan Declaration and, everything, and all this other junk. Evangelicals and Catholics together. And there's all this ecumenical schmooze. And of course, Revoice did it. I, I will tell you, as, as, few, as few as two or three years ago, I was still naive enough, even then, to think, if, if a PCA church had Roman Catholic speakers at a, at a conference, they're, they're going to lose their jobs. They're going to get excommunicated. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Doesn't work that way. No, no, no. Um, apparently, you can do almost anything you want um, with impunity. And you can promote Romanism. And when, when called out on it, say, well, we don't agree with them on everything. We don't agree with Rome on the gospel. We don't agree with them on how you get to heaven. And I'm not talking about a small, subtle difference. We don't agree on the most basic things when it comes to how you get to heaven. So, in fact, um, where's that book? Here it is. Just been reading, just started reading this. And I've been marking it up and putting uh, tabs and stuff in it. It's called The Triumph of Grace, Augustine's Writings on Salvation by N.R. Needham. Uh, this is the guy that wrote the four-volume set, uh, 2,000 Years of Christ's Power, which I've, I've got in my library, in my church history shelf over there. I think it's over there. But I have the Kindle version of those books, too. And they're, they're great. They're, they're really, really, really great. But this is, is, is a gr has been a great read so far. I really have enjoyed it. Um, in the back here, it's got the, uh, the, the canons of the Synod of Orange from 529, which, which condemned Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism. And I've got, I've got some of those things highlighted here. And, you know, why, why would I take the time to do this? I mean, this book, I'm pretty sure it's out of print, just like every other good book I've ever written. Out of print. Everything good's out of print. Why, why take the time to read something like that? Because everything that people argue about today is, is the same. There's, there ain't, there's nothing new under the sun. We're still fussing and fighting about the same things. And there are things that we have to fuss and fight about. You know why we have to? Because the Apostle Paul did. Because the Apostle John did. Because Jesus did. Ezekiel did. Isaiah did. They fought against heresy and against error. Because they knew that falsehood cannot save you. It is the truth that saves us. It is the truth that saves that sets us free. And that's why churchmen that love the church and love the gospel have always been willing to fight for those things. To fight for them and also to separate uh, from those that are indifferent to the truth, uh, those that are willing to compromise on the truth. And this is what made R.C. Sproul so special. This guy lost most of his friends, I think, when the, the Evangelicals and Catholics Together document thing happened in, in 1994. Um, and then there was the Manhattan Declaration. There's been a whole bunch of other... There's all sorts of ecumenical schmooze going on all the time. And now you have, you know, Reformed churches doing stuff with Roman Catholic speakers at their conferences. Um, you realize, of course, the first and second generation Reformers would have excommunicated people for that. They would have been, they would have been defrocked immediately for such things, for such compromises. Today, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Today it's, well, we're not saying we don't agree with them on everything. My point is, if you're saying that um, the issues that separate uh, Reformed churches from Roman Catholicism are, they're, they're, they're significant, but they're, but they're not showstoppers, then I have to wonder what you believe about how you get to heaven. And are you okay with people that deny the truth? So anyway, R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul was a jewel that God gave the church. He, he is the epitome of Ephesians chapter 4, where the ascended Christ from on high gives pastors and teachers to the church. Je Jesus fashioned and sent a really good teacher to the church in R.C. Sproul. And so I wanted to play this sermon that he preached uh, a while back and, uh, and comment on it along the way because I, I think it's just so excellent. And uh, let's, so let's listen to Dr. Sproul. Oh, it's been such a delight these last couple days to be with you for this conference. We're very much encouraged to see so many of you out for it. And I have uh, basked in the glory of listening to the messages from the other men that have been brought, and I hope that we've all been edified by them. I particularly was interested in John's last address when he was so candid about his... 
John, meaning John MacArthur. Um, feelings when he wrote the gospel according to Jesus, how shocked he was that he would have to write a book like that in the evangelical world. And I remember being just as shocked at that time that the doctrine of justification would ever become an issue within evangelicalism. And let's see, the thing is, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says, I'm shocked. The term thalmazo, I am astonished. I marvel that you are so quickly turning away. And so what we need to do is we need to train ourselves to, to quit saying, I'm shocked, I'm shocked, I'm shocked. These things shouldn't shock us. The, the New Testament is filled with warnings that such things are going to happen from within, side, from within the church itself. Since evangelicalism is a broad spectrum of denominations, Protestant denominations dating back to the Reformation, and we all have our different distinctives, but the two concepts that unified evangelicalism for hundreds of years were first of all sola scriptura, the final authority of scripture, and secondly sola fide, uh, the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Uh, sola scriptura was considered the uh, formal cause of the 16th century reformation and sola fide, the material cause the matter, the substance of the issue that provoked the Reformation. And that makes sense because it, it was because of Rome's denial of Sola Scriptura that they got the Gospel wrong. Um, you have to have those two things together. You need to believe in Sola Scriptura. And what is Sola Scriptura? Very simply stated, it's if you were to tally up on, on your hand the number of sources of divine, fixed, and unchanging revelation from God, special revelation from God to the Church, there is one the Bible. It is the only source of, of God-breathed, inspired revelation that God gave to his church. It's the only thing that we have today that's actually God-breathed, verbal, fixed, unchanging, and inspired. And if you deny that, yeah, you're going to get the gospel wrong. Pretty much every group that denies Sola Scriptura gets the gospel wrong. In the 16th century, and this unity through the years had been so strong the last thing I really ever expected was that there would be a debate within evangelicalism on either one of these topics. Well, first came the erosion of confidence in the authority of scriptures within evangelicalism. You might recall the book that was written uh, by Harold Lenzel, The Battle for the Bible, and then the formation of ICBI, the International Council on Biblical Inerrancy, which had a 10-year initiative trying to encourage the church, and particularly the evangelical church, not to abandon their confidence in the inspiration and authority of sacred scripture. But I, I understood something of that crisis because of the avalanche of criticism that the church has been exposed to on the doctrine of scripture in the last couple of hundred years. I remember that at the turn of the century, I don't remember it, but I remember reading about it. I'm thinking, when I say the turn of the century, I mean the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, that uh, it was said that biblical criticism had degenerated into biblical vandalism. vandalism. Yeah. So severe had been the attacks on sacred scripture. So I wasn't caught completely off guard that the issue of scripture would emerge even within evangelical churches, but that the doctrine of justification by faith alone? See, and think about that. Why, why would that be so, just so unreal that the doctrine of justification by faith alone would, be, would come under attack? Because justification by faith alone is the gospel. That's the issue. That's why it's so shocking. Why would evangelicals, with all their different distinctives, as he said, wouldn't you think there'd be one thing they'd hold on to with incredible ferocity, that it would be the heart of the gospel, the heart of what Jesus did to save us from our sins and to get us to heaven, which is the blessed truth that God justifies the wicked by imputing the righteousness of Christ to them and by not imputing their sins to them because Christ has borne them. You would think that would be a non-negotiable. If there's one piece of the Christian faith that that's, you would die for, it'd be that one. 
would become an issue. And then the Lordship Salvation controversy where John MacArthur fought for the angels, that was a total shock, but not nearly the shock of what came in its wake. Now, John MacArthur um, wrote the book, The Gospel According to Jesus, which um, I have, and I've, I've actually got the audio, the audible version of it, and I've listened to it. And I listened to the revised version. Apparently, he made some problematic statements um, in, the, in the early editions of that book where he conflated uh, repentance and faith as if they were almost identical to one another or like the, the changed life is like part, almost like built into what faith itself is. And that's not what faith is. And I know that he was uh, challenged on that and, <clears throat> um, and changed and modified uh, some of that. I haven't heard anything in the audible version that, that I found objectionable. Uh, so I, I think he did modify some of his um, some of his formulations. So that that's a good thing. That shows that he's humble before the Word of God and willing to be corrected. Where leading evangelicals declared to the world that there was now a unity of faith in the gospel between Roman Catholics and evangelicals. And that's what Dr. Sproul emphasized during the evangelicals and Catholics together document um, fiasco. These people, Chuck Colson, J.I. Packer, Bill Bright, um, and some others, were saying, we now agree with Rome on the doctrine of justification. Because we all can affirm the statement, we are justified by grace through faith because of Christ. And uh, noticeably absent from that phrase is the word alone. Without which, without which you don't have enough clarity. <coughs> really surprised me uh, radically. And before I get going with this today, I just want to say I've heard many, many statements by leading representatives of various uh, sections of Christendom over the last 20 years about this, where I've heard one scholar write that the Reformation is over. I've heard yeah, I believe that was Mark Knoll. Um, Mark Knoll actually wrote a really good book um, called um, Turning Points, about turning points in church history that I, I read and thought was, was very good. He also wrote a book on the history of Christianity in the United States and Canada, which is, is good. At least the sections of it that I've read are really good. But yeah, that was a surprise for him to say, yeah, Reformation, Reformation's over. I heard other ones say that the Protestant Reformation was, quote, a tempest in a teapot. I think that was either Colson or Packer said that, which is unbelievable. That J.I. Packer signed the Evangelicals and Catholics Together document and then defended signing it. Um, J.I. Packer wrote the book Knowing God, which is a wonderful book. He wrote the introduction to the death of death and the death of Christ and the introduction to the uh, newest publication, uh, republishing of The Bondage of the Will by Martin Luther. And those introductions are so excellent that they themselves should be published as a separate book. And then I remember finding out that guy, J.I. Packer, signed the ECT document? How could he do that? Amazing. And they, they said, yeah, Reformation was a tempest in a teapot. Another evangelical leader saying that the Protestant Reformation was all a misunderstanding. I heard another leader say that in the 16th century, Luther was right, but not today. I've heard many leaders say that Vatican Council II changed the Roman Catholic doctrine of salvation and of justification. Which, of course, it can't. Uh, no Roman Catholic uh, Council is allowed to change anything that Rome has dogmatically defined because they believe that they are incapable of making errors. That's part of the problem. That, that is... That really is the fatal flaw of Roman Catholicism. They have exempted themselves from the possibility of error, and therefore, they can't be reformed. They can't be corrected by the Word of God. One of the great things about being a Christian, for my part, is if someone can walk me through the text of Scripture and show me, you are wrong about this, or wrong about that, I change my beliefs to conform to the Word of God. The Roman Catholic religion cannot do that. It doesn't matter what you show them in Scripture. No matter how flagrantly their dogmas contradict scripture, they will look you square in the eye and say, that doesn't contradict scripture. And you think, how can you not see that? Because they don't believe in sola scriptura. 
they believe that the church is infallible if the church tells them what we teach you is in perfect harmony with the word of god then it doesn't matter how, how flagrant the contradiction is they will not believe that their dogmas contradict scripture even when they clearly do you know there's a great biblical example of that in matthew 15 and mark 7 the korban rule the pharisees taught the korban rule that whatever you might have given to your parents is a gift devoted to god and thus they nullify the fifth commandment to honor your father and mother now when jesus explained this to them that this tradition this korban rule that they had that it contradicted the fifth commandment i've asked my little kids in my in my house during family worship kids isn't it pretty obvious to you that this tradition violates the fifth commandment and they all say well sh of course it does i said but did the pharisees agree with jesus when he pointed this out to them no well why, why didn't they isn't it obviously isn't it obvious that this contradicts the fifth commandment well yeah it is obvious but why didn't they submit to it and go oh we need to change that belief then we need to get rid of that tradition because they didn't believe in sola scriptura once a person denies sola scriptura they'll believe anything no matter how absurd it is they'll still believe it and uh again all of these statements indicate you know that the confidence that people have said that the Roman Church has changed her doctrine on justification and that again the proclamation of evangelicals and Catholics together was that we now have a unity of faith in the gospel and that provoked a radical crisis within evangelicalism and I was a lightning rod in that as well as was John MacArthur and I said to my friends those evangelical leaders who were involved in that, I said, I'm puzzled because you say you have a unity of faith in the gospel with men who still strongly affirm the Council of Trent. I know I don't have a unity of faith in the gospel with those men. So my question is, do I have a unity of faith with you? See, that's my question too. With being in the PCA and people affirming as brothers and sisters in Christ, members of the Roman Catholic Church. And you think, okay, I don't have unity with the Roman Catholic Church, but you think that you do, or at least, you know, you don't agree with them on everything, but nothing they believe is a real showstopper to you. It makes me wonder, do I have unity with you? If you have a unity of faith in the gospel <coughs> with them, and I don't have a unity of faith in the gospel with them. How can I possibly have a unity of faith in the gospel with you? Exactly. And so this exactly. activity that was supposed to bring believers together actually drove a serious wedge did. within the evangelical world itself. And that's what always happens. When people try to, to get together with people that have flagrantly contradictory beliefs, and one of the groups has to give up something to join with them they don't create unity between the two groups they create a whole bunch of other groups they end up creating even more fractures in the church and i came to the conclusion after reading ect1 ect2 ect3 that many of our evangelical leaders simply either did not understand Roman Catholic theology right. or they didn't understand historical Protestant theology. Yeah. I came to the sad conclusion that many of them didn't understand either. Either one. Either one. And yeah. what I want to look at today is how critically important it is that we stand firm on this essential doctrine of the Christian faith. I'll just say this further aside. During the heat of that controversy, I was in conversation in a room with several of the leaders, and I asked one of them, I said, do you believe that the doctrine of justification by faith alone is essential to the gospel? Okay, now think about that. How would you answer that question? Do you believe that justification by faith alone is essential to the gospel? My answer to that question is yes. And without it, you don't have the gospel. And he looked at me and he said, well, I would say it's central to the gospel. <laughs> I don't see how anything can be central to the gospel but and not, not at the same time be central to it. 
But I said, that's not what I asked you. I asked you, do you think that the doctrine of justification by faith alone is essential to the gospel? No matter how hard I pled, uh, it was like pulling teeth. I could not get the man to say that sola fide was essential to the gospel. This that had to be either Chuck Colson or J.I. Packer. It had to be one of them. I wish he would say who it was. When the Apostle Paul had seen that it was not only essential to the gospel, but without it, you don't have the gospel. Exactly right. You have another gospel, and there, of course, is not another gospel. So there's been... And that, that is the direct, direct teaching of the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 1. And Galatians 1, 6 through 9, it just, it's just not going to go away. And no matter how many times people say, hey, it's okay, revoice. Well, of course they had Roman Catholic speakers because they're an ecumenical group. Excuse me, time out. Our commitment to the Bible, our commitment to Jesus Christ and to the gospel as ministers requires us not to be ecumenical with people who deny the gospel. We can't do that. I was shocked at some of the statements that, I, that I've heard people say. Well, they're an ecumenical group. We aren't ecumenical. You know why we're not? Because the apostles weren't. The New Testament isn't ecumenical when it comes to the gospel. Massive confusion about the doctrine of justification. Here's one other thing I've heard. I've heard it said a hundred times. Well, after all, R.C., we're not saved by believing in the doctrine of justification by faith alone. You know who says that all the time? Doug Wilson, the Federal Vision. You guys think that, that you're justified by articulating justification by faith alone correctly. So when you die, you think you have to go over and take your comprehensive sola fide exam. You got to take your, your justification by faith alone test and you have to write it down correctly. Now what Sproul is going to go on to say here is, that's stupid. No one is saying that we're justified by the doctrine of justification by faith alone. No one is saying that. And the thing is, if there has ever been a doctrine of the Christian faith that would mitigate against the idea that you're justified by articulating the doctrine in an orthodox way, it's the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And that should be so obvious. It, it amazes me that people would, would make an argument that, that that is that foolish. We're not saved by articulating the doctrine correctly. No one is saying that. And yet the Federal Vision, that's all they ever say. That's all Doug Wilson ever says. And, beloved, there is no doctrine that's ever been confessed in the Christian church that would more strongly assert that one cannot be saved by believing in the doctrine of justification by faith alone than, than the, doctrine. the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Because the doctrine of justification by faith alone is only shorthand for saying that we are saved by, that we are justified by, by faith in Jesus Christ, Christ alone. alone. Not by faith in the doctrine, doctrine. of justification by faith alone. <laughs> I mean, a person can believe and affirm. That, and that's why I'm willing to say that. I mean, I don't throw the word stupid out there, you know, j just to be mean. It, it to, to say... Well, you guys are saying that we're justified by the doctrine, by, by getting the doctrine right. That's stupid. That is a stupid thing to say. No one is saying that. No one has ever said that. When I evangelize people, when I preach, when I do pastoral care, what I am trying to, to get people to understand is you need to believe in Jesus and trust in Jesus and nothing else. Nothing alongside of him or in addition to him. It is Christ alone. And that's what justification by faith alone is all about. It is justification by the righteousness of Christ alone. That's the issue. Not, you guys are saying that we're justified by the doctrine. That's what those Federal Vision heretics said that all the time. And that's a total red herring and an absurdity. It, it really is a dumb thing to say. Because the doctrine itself is a, is a straight up denial of that very thing. The doctrine of justification by faith alone and not be saved. On the other hand, I worry about those 
who deny the doctrine of justification by faith alone and wonder if they indeed can be saved while at the same time denying an essential truth of the Christian faith. And I would, I would assert in addition to that, I also wonder if someone can be saved who tolerates denials of justification by faith alone. Can someone be saved who, who thinks that that's not a, that big of a deal? It, it's, it's, we disagree with it, but it's not that big of a deal. Can they be saved? What do they think the gospel really is? Well, having said that, by way of preface, let me read for you a few verses from Paul's letter to the Galatians. In the first chapter, beginning at verse 3, where the apostle in characteristic fashion addresses the people by saying, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our <coughs> sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Then the <coughs> apostle articulates his apostolic astonishment mm -hmm. where he yes. says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, mm -hmm. which is not another. But there are some who would trouble you that want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. There is nowhere in sacred scripture where the apostles Paul speaks more strongly right. and more nowhere. vehemently than he does here. If anybody nowhere. preaches any other gospel than that which you have received, let him be anathema. Anathema. Let him be anathema. Yep. Let him be damned, damned is what hell. he is saying. <laughs> And then he goes on to say, and then and then we're told, we're told that we're harsh and mean, and we don't like your tone. <laughs> um, as I've said before, my, my in the pulpit here, the Apostle Paul would be unemployable today. Th he wouldn't be called by anybody today, because he's his tone is just too harsh. He's just too harsh. For do I now persuade men or God? Hmm. Do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Mm, How is it verse. possible in this day and age that the gospel has been so broadly negotiated within evangelicals? And the only answer I can give is the church has been inundated with the influence of the secular culture yep. of relativism. That's right. No, without a doubt. And we want so much. That, that is what's behind the statements. Well, Revoice is an ecumenical group. So, what? of course, we would expect them to have Roman Catholic speakers. And I'm just like, yeah, but that's not okay. Because Rome doesn't believe the true gospel. And even if those individuals happen to be Christians, they're still representing a system. You are endorsing a system that denies the biblical gospel and comes under the anathema of God in Galatians 1. Isn't that significant for many today? No, it's okay. To get along with everybody, we want to please men, mm -hmm. we want to avoid conflict, and I don't know anybody who enjoys conflict. Yeah. I surely don't. The Apostle don't Paul here, when he writes to the Galatians, said, may grace and peace to you. Yeah. We love peace. And I hear people say, doctrine divides. <laughs> and the thing is, it is doctrine alone that unites. What unites Christians against the world is our creed, is what we believe, is the truth of Scripture. Yes, it does. <laughs> yep, doctrine it does. has always divided. 
Jesus and the Pharisees were sharply divided mm -hmm. over the identity of the Messiah. That was a doctrinal issue. Yep. Every epistle that comes from the pen of the Apostle Paul has to address Heresy and false teaching. divisions caused by false doctrines entering into the church. Yep. Now, let me say to you, before again I go over this historical reconnaissance with you, that I'm talking now today about the difference between the Reformation and biblical view of justification by faith alone and the Roman Catholic doctrine of justification. And I want to say, I think that the contrast between the biblical doctrine of justification and the Roman Catholic doctrine of justification is a great litmus test to find out what a man or a woman who professes to know Christ, what they really do think about the essential truths of the gospel. Because if a person would say, yes, I believe in justification. Yes, I think it's, it's, a, it's a central truth. It's a very important truth. But they're okay with people denying it. That really makes me wonder what, what it is that they really have a conviction about. See, but we live in an age of anti-conviction, where you can't have convictions because that's just mean. You're just mean. I'm not, I understand that there has been a tremendous split within Rome since the mid-60s of the 20th century between the so-called Theologie Nouvelle, the new theology, the progressive wing, wing of the Roman Catholic Church, particularly in Germany, Switzerland, Holland, Canada, and the United States, and what was called the Latin wing of the church, found in Spain, Portugal, and Italy, and a lot of France, and Latin America, and Eastern Europe. And when I'm talking today about the Roman Catholic view of justification, I understand <laughs> that there are many priests in America who really affirm what we would call the doctrine of justification by faith alone, and probably yeah. millions of Catholic adherents who actually believe the doctrine of justification by faith alone. We call them crypto-Protestants. They're Protestants. They don't know that they're Protestants, <laughs> but they are. <laughs> now, the vast majority of Protestants... And by, by the way, um, what he's saying there about the, the divisions in the Roman Catholic religion, I mean, it, it, they're very significant. Um, John Paul II, he was the Pope for most of my life. <coughs> And then when, when he died, then it was Benedict the Sixteenth, and now it's this, this uh, liberal hippie Frank, Pope Francis guy. But John Paul II did things, said things, that would have gotten him tied to a stake and burned in the 16th century. I mean, Pope John Paul II engaged in ecumenical activity that was, was so mind-blowing that even, even to think about it now, it's, it's shocking. I think it was in 1986, the, the prayer summit at Assisi in Italy, they had pagan cult leaders, voodoo priests, um, witch doctors, um, Islamic clerics, Buddhists, Zoroastrians, <laughs> liberal Protestants, and Roman Catholics. They all took turns praying for world peace. Now, can you imagine Paul, Jesus, Peter, and John getting together with the Gnostics, the Arians, uh, the Galatian Judaizers, um, and other and uh, uh, and modalists to pray together for world peace? It's crazy. <clears throat> the whole concept of antithesis is gone. Now, John Paul II did did that kind of stuff. That kind of ecumenical activity that would have gotten him in a lot of trouble years ago, long ago. But, you know, the, to say that Rome is a united front is really just not the case. It, it really isn't. Uh, they're, they're most, for the most part, cafeteria-style Catholics. I mean, I, the Roman Catholic people I grew up with in Cincinnati, Ohio, the huge German Catholic population of Cincinnati, I mean, they, they were all over the place in terms of what they did or did not believe. <coughs> Protestants, on the other hand, if you ask them, are you a Protestant, <coughs> and they say yes, 
And then you follow it up with the next question, what is it that you're protesting? They don't have a clue. And yeah. that's why some church historians are saying, there was a great battle over this doctrine in the 16th century, but people really don't care that much about it today, and so it's not that big of a deal. I just want to point out, oh. I just want to point out, what people don't care about today is irrelevant. What's true is what's relevant. Whether entire denominations start saying, you guys are just so mean, I don't care. People say that. What's true remains true, whether men esteem it as such or not. All that's at stake here is the simple question, how is a person saved? Yeah, that's no big deal. How you get into heaven? When Desiderius Erasmus wrote his diatribe against mm -hmm. Luther, in Luther's response, he said to Erasmus, I thank you that you haven't bothered me with trivial matters mm -hmm. such as the authority of the Pope or the place of Mary or the sacraments in Rome, mm -hmm. but you have asked me about the essence of the gospel, and we could focus our attention on this. Now, as again, I'm going to be <coughs> saying today my understanding of the Roman Catholic understanding of the gospel, not the London Catholic Church, not the Berlin Catholic Church, not the Bern or Zurich Catholic Church, or the Amsterdam Catholic Church, or the Boston Catholic Church, or the Los Angeles Catholic Church. I'm talking about the Roman Catholic Church, the one whose headquarters is in Italy, in Rome. Which church has official dogma defined in church councils and in papal encyclicals? And at the time of the Protestant Reformation, the most important response of Rome to Luther and Calvin, Zwingli and Knox and the rest of the magisterial reformers came by way of an ecumenical council that was held in Trento, which is called the Council of Trent. And in the sixth session of the Council of Trent, the Roman Catholic Church did two things in that session. One, it defined her doctrine of justification in the I just want to point out, <clears throat> one of the first books I ever bought on the internet, on Amazon, was a copy, an English translation, <clears throat> of the Canons and Decrees of the Council of Trent. I bought it when I was 23 years old, and I read the whole thing, from front to back, <clears throat> with a Bible. And I did not understand just how bad Roman Catholic theology was until I did that. I would encourage people, you, want to, you really want to understand what the Reformation was all about? Read the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent. Read the whole document. And you will see, we're not talking about religions that are similar but have a few differences. We're talking about religious systems that are so diametrically opposed to one another that that's why it's so shocking to me when ostensibly reformed ministers seem to be blissfully unaware of how serious our disagreements with Rome are and what those disagreements are about, namely, how you get to heaven, the gospel. The decrees, and then the second section was the canons, the or the anathemas, mm -hmm. that were written against the Reformation understanding of the gospel. When I read the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent, um, I, I stopped keeping track at about 100. Once I counted the number of anathemas that I personally was under, because of what I believe, I stopped keeping track of how many times the Roman religion had anathematized me. In the 16th century, though, many of the canons of Trent missed the mark and failed to really capture the essence of Protestant teaching. Mm -hmm. They hit the bullseye when it came to sola fide. And there's no doubt that at Trent in the sixth session, the Reformation doctrine and understanding of the gospel was given the anathema of the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, it says, I believe it's Canon 11, if anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, let him be anathema. Some people say, well, that lasted until Vatican II when everything changed. No. No, it didn't. Vatican II did not Vatican alter anything. in any way the Roman view of justification. In fact, John XXIII, when he convened the council, which was called the Unexpected Council, 
made it very clear that the point of the council was to deal with ecclesiology and not with theology and doctrine like issues of justification. And if you're familiar with the Catholic Catechism of the decade of the 1990s, you will see that that catechism strongly and categorically reaffirms it does. what was taught at the Council of Trent mm -hmm. with respect to justification. Of course it reaffirms it because the church embraces the doctrine of infallibility. And Rome suffers from the problem of what I call theological hemophilia. You scratch her, <laughs> she bleeds to death. She can't say, mea culpa, our doctrine that we express ecumenically at the ecumenical council. I cannot emphasize how important that is. This is why, I'm going to say this, I've been saying this since I was in my 20s, I'm, I'm in my mid-40s now. Ecumenical dialogue with Roman Catholicism is a waste of time. We cannot help them because they don't believe that they can make errors. Years ago, I used to interact with Catholic apologists on web forums. And, you know, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed. Pasa grafe theopneustas. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. And for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Correction. I posted a question. How does scripture correct the Roman Catholic Church? And people hemmed and hawed and everything else. And one of them finally just came out and said, it can't. Because we don't make errors. The church is infallible. I'm like, that's your problem. You see, Christians have the word of God. The word of God corrects us. When someone demonstrates we're wrong about something, we change to conform to the word of God. Rome cannot be reformed. Because she has, arrogantly, I say, exempted herself from the possibility of error. And therefore, therefore, all attempts to sit down at the table and dialogue with them, the only thing that's ever going to happen is the Protestants are going to compromise. And that's, that, that is what has happened. Every time it's done, that's what happens. Ecumenical dialogue with Rome is a waste of time. Rome, the Roman Catholic religion is a mission field. That desperately, desperately needs to be evangelized with the gospel. And sadly, with all the ecumenical schmooze and all the ecumenical activities that are going on, at the end of the day, people can spew their venom at me for my tone or because I'm not nice enough or, some, or not liberal enough or something. But at the end of the day, these poor people are being left in their sins to go to hell because people won't tell them the true gospel. Trent was wrong. They can change their attitude, their rhetoric. Instead of calling us schismatics and heretics, they can refer to us that they did at Vatican II separated as separated brethren. brethren. Separated brethren. They can be much nicer, gentler, and kinder. You see, the Council of Florence in the 15th century said that um, Jews, heretics, and schismatics cannot become participants in eternal life, but will depart this life into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels unless they are added to the fold of the Roman Catholic Church. And then Vatican II said, well, they're, they're separated brethren. And their churches are a means of salvation. Really? Separated brethren? I wonder what John Huss would think about that. When he was tied to a stake and burned to death in 1415 at the Council of Constance. I wonder what, what he would have thought about, yeah, we're separated brethren. I wonder what the peaceful Christian people of the Piedmont Valley in the Alps, who were mercilessly smoked out of their caves and massacred in the snow by papal armies, did they think that they were just separated brethren? I doubt it. But their doctrine hasn't changed. And let me give you a brief summary of the Roman Catholic understanding of the gospel. And don't take my word for it. Check it out yourself. Mm -hmm. Study Read the decrees of the Council of Trent, yep. particularly in the sixth session. Yep. Now, let me begin by saying that so often Protestants falsely accuse the Roman Catholic Church of teaching something they don't teach and never have taught. The Roman Catholic Church does not teach salvation by works. They do not teach that. And in fact, they place the anathema of God upon anyone who would teach that you're saved by works. What they teach 
is that you're justified and saved and get into heaven by grace-enabled works. Not works by themselves, but grace-produced works. Some Protestants say, well, we believe in justification by faith. Rome believes in justification by works. We believe in justification by grace. Rome believes in justification by merit. We believe in justification by Christ. Rome believes in justification by the person themselves. That is pure slander it against is. Rome. It is. That's not what Rome teach. teaches now. It taught in the 16th century. It has always taught that faith is necessary for justification. Well, mm -hmm. let me just say they taught it in the 16th century. And they've taught it for most of their, their lives. They're beginning to be shaky on this, as John MacArthur just pointed out a few uh, moments ago. Some of them are saying now they don't have to have faith in order to be saved. But in the like Pope John Paul II, well, if you're if you're uh, an atheist and you're a nice person and who if if you are uh, pure in your thoughts and and are faithful to whatever religion you profess, you know you can gain eternal life that way. And of course, Pope Francis is even is even farther to the left than John Paul II was. That's why it was such a strange thing. The three popes that, that have been on the papal chair during my lifetime. John Paul II was ecumenical and liberal and strange. Benedict XVI was a, was a staunch, like, traditional Roman Catholic conservative. I mean, Benedict, jo Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger was his name before he was Benedict XVI. Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, he was the head of the, of the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith of the Church of Rome, which, by the way, is the modern incarnation of the Inquisition. So, Benedict XVI was, was a real different kind of pope than John Paul II. And now you have this liberal hippie guy who says that, you know, atheists go to heaven and, and you know, is asked about gay marriage and homosexuality, and he says, who am I to judge, man? You know, it's like... Wow, how the mighty have fallen. Ichabod, uh, the glory has departed. The Roman Church has said that faith in Jesus Christ is a necessary condition for justification. But it's not sufficient. That's, and that's the problem. It's not faith alone. It's faith plus works that are produced and enabled by grace. That is to say, you can't be justified without it. At Trent... The Romans said three specific things about faith. They said faith is in the first instance the initium, the fundamentum, and the second point, and the third point, the rodex of justification. The, that is the, the initium, it is the beginning of justification, the fundamentum, the foundation for justification, and the root. And the rodex, the root of mm -hmm. justification. So you can yeah. see. With these three affirmations in the sixth session, that Rome took a strong view of the importance and necessity of having faith in Jesus Christ in order to be saved. And though they say that faith is a necessary condition to be saved, it is not a sufficient condition. Right. Meaning, you can have what we would call saving faith and not be saved. And that's the problem. They're very clear about that. Read the, the, the sixth session of the Council of Trent, all the definitional articles, and then the anathemas, the canons that follow it. It's not very long. You can look it up online. In fact, I'll, put a, I'll try to put a link to it in the description here. Just read session six of the Council of Trent and, and look at what it says. They say you have to have faith. You have to have faith to be, to be saved. But you can have true faith and not be saved. And therein is the problem. You have to have faith to get it. But that faith is not enough to get it. Mm -hmm. Indeed, when Rome spells out the dilemma of the commission of mortal sin, they maintain that a person can have saving faith, mm -hmm. commit mortal sin, lose justification, lose your salvation, while you still have the faith. You hear that? So if you commit a mortal sin and you still have true faith, saving faith in Jesus, you can not be saved. And you have to go to a priest and be absolved of that sin and do penance, which the Council of Trent calls penance, which is a sacrament. Um, or, or, excuse me, is it, is, yeah, penance, 
Isn't Penis a I'm pretty sure it is. Um, they call that the second plank. The second plank of justification is penance. So obviously faith is not enough. It's not faith alone that gets you into Christ and into salvation. There has to be something more. Now, how does it work? Well, justification in the first instance, according to Rome, is communicated sacerdotally. Baptism. That is through the sacraments. And Rome is careful to define it this way, that the instrumental cause of justification, the means by which justification is communicated to the person, the instrument that causes it, is in the first instance the sacrament of baptism. At baptism, the righteousness of Christ, the grace of justification, is poured in or infused, ex opera operato, that is by the working of the works, into the soul of the person who receives that sacrament. Mm -hmm. Now, the sacrament... So it's not really baptismal regeneration, it's, it's baptismal justification. I mean, in Roman Catholic theology, ju justification is by baptism. That's how you're justified. Self doesn't automatically save you. It automatically infuses the grace of justification, but in order to be saved, you have to do two things, according to Trent, cooperare and assentare. Assent and cooperate. Cooperate with and assent to that infused grace. Now, if you cooperate with the grace of baptism, assent to the grace of baptism, then you are in a state of justification. All right, this is the gospel now. This is how you're saved. Now, the good news is you're now in a state of justification. The bad news is if you commit a mortal sin, you lose your justification. You lose your salvation. It's gone. But that's not the end of the world, because as Rome defines it in Trent, there is a second plank of justification for those who have made shipwreck, shipwreck of, of their, their faith. faith. Mm -hmm. And the way you make shipwreck of your faith, again, is by committing mortal, mortal sin. sin. Mortal sin is distinguished from venial sin, is sin that is so severe that it kills the saving grace in your soul. That's why it's called mortal. If you die like that, in a state of mortal sin, you will go to hell. Unless you've been justified again through the sacrament of penance. And if you commit mortal sin, you lose your justification, but it can be restored. Again, through a sacrament. In this case, it is the sacrament of penance, which was at the eye of the tornado in the 16th century. Because the elements of penance have several parts to it. First of all, there is confession. You come to the priest and you confess your sins. Father, I have sinned because I've done this, that, and the other thing. That wasn't the issue in the 16th century. Nor was it the issue that after you give your act of contrition and confess your sin, where the priest then pronounces your forgiveness, he says, Te absolvo. I absolve you. I absolve you. And even that wasn't the issue in the 16th century because the Protestants agreed that Jesus did give the authority to his representatives to bind on earth, to bind on heaven, and to pronounce God's forgiveness for those who repent of their sins. We do that in Protestant churches all the time. Yep. In the <coughs> uh, promise of of the assurance of pardon assurance for all of, pardon. of those who confess their sins. Yeah. And that's what we do when we do uh, communion. And the pastor's response, I read passages that, that are assurances of forgiveness. And all those who have true faith in Jesus and repentance unto life can know for sure that they are forgiven. Where the problem came in was in the next point. Penance. After yeah. absolution came works of satisfaction. Okay, now we're going to stop here. We're at the, the hour mark, and I'm going to uh, bookmark this. Let's see, where are we in here? 26 minutes and 9 seconds in.
Um, but thank you for, for listening um, or for watching. This is a, such an important issue, um, and R.C. Sproul um, was so clear in his uh, teaching on it, and that's why I wanted to go ahead and let him speak for himself and just comment along the way. So I hope that this has been beneficial to you and enjoyable to you.